Good morning and welcome to the Naval Historical Foundation's second Saturday for November 2022, where we're featuring the uh, a, a treatise on the, the Second Battle of Guadalcanal featuring some remarkable panelists, Paul Stilwell, author of Battleship Commander, and Trent Hone, who uh, has a recent book out uh, called Mastering the Art of Command, and it's, it's, a, it's a can't miss read. You need to read both of those books. But he also has a Navy history special edition on the Battle of Guadalcanal, and as well, his excellent book, Learning War. And we're going to focus on chapter five of that, where uh, we, we really spend some time on heuristic Guadalcanal. These panelists are extraordinary, and we're, we're so pleased they're here. We're sponsored today by Huntington Angles Shipbuilding and by Enterprise Rental Car. And I, I, anecdotally, Enterprise Rental Car is owned by uh, Andy Taylor and his wife, Barbara, but uh, they are the son and daughter-in-law of Jack Taylor, who served on the carrier Hornet in the Battle of Midway, but also on the carrier Enterprise, thus the name. But uh, we are also recording today at the Jack C. Taylor Center on the grounds of the prestigious and impressive United States Naval Institute in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, hit like, so subscribe, and um, ring the bell for future content. We're happy you're here, and uh, let's just get right into it. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Really appreciate your uh, participation. And, uh, and of course, 1942, right on the heels of uh, the 7th of December, uh, uh, Admiral Nimitz takes charge and the fleet gets busy. Can, can the, both of you discuss you know, kind of that chronology that led to Guadalcanal. Absolutely. So, as you say, after Pearl Harbor, Nimitz assumes command at the end of December, and he's being you know, pressured not just to defend Hawaii and the lines of communication uh, to Australia, but also to, to take the initiative to assume some offensive action, to have a positive impact on morale. This is you know, a direct uh, message from Admiral King, the new commander-in-chief. And Nimitz works out with his staff a series of uh, raids using the forces that are available to the Pacific Fleet in the aftermath of Pearl Harbor. Uh, the carrier task forces are available. They're, they're small for the most uh, part for through those early months. They're operating as singletons, uh, but they do prosecute a number of important raids uh, in the Marshall and Gilbert Islands, uh, Wake Island, Marcus Island. These are all attacked. Uh, there is an attempt to strike or ball in the South Pacific. Uh, it, it, it fails when uh, Japanese bombers uh, attempt to uh, inflict damage on the carrier Lexington, but a second carrier is sent to the south, and they effectively strike uh, Japanese invasion forces on the northern coast of New Guinea at Leh and Salamala. And then there is, of course, the famous Doolittle Raid. And all these activities uh, draw Japanese uh, attention and, and focus the, the combined fleet on an effort to uh, eliminate the threat of the Pacific Fleet, and that leads to Midway. So there's an awful lot of activity early on. Uh, well, on and Cincinnati. interestingly, going into Guadalcanal was counter to the overall U.S. strategy of Europe first. Uh, the idea was uh, attack, invade Europe, and fight a defensive action in the Pacific. But events didn't really permit that. Of course, we had Coral Sea, we had Midway. But Admiral King carried the day in the Joint Chiefs to go on the offensive in Guadalcanal. There had been ultra messages pointing out that the Japanese were setting up uh, an airfield on Guadalcanal, which would have allowed them to control the Coral Sea area and what have you. There were also reports from Coast Watchers, and so King said, we must go now, even though General Vandegrift and his Marines didn't really have much preparation time. Yeah, I think it's so interesting. Uh, the King doesn't accept this Germany first idea. That Now, that needs some qualification. I mean, he accepts it as the priority of uh, the Allied forces, but he's not willing to sit passively back and allow the Japanese to uh, retain the initiative in the Pacific. So after Midway, uh, there's an opportunity here. Ah, the Japanese are building this airfield. They're threatening the lines of communication with Australia. We have to preserve those. And he orders Nimitz to initiate the offensive that turns into the battle for Guadalcanal and retroactively seeks approval from General Marshall, uh, his peer on, on the chiefs, Joint Chiefs of Staff. 
Uh, and, and Marshall goes along with it, I think, to, to his credit. But King's maneuvering, uh, to me, is, is, is a fascinating story. He's very adept. Now, in the er early days of, of Guadalcanal, and of course that period was August to February, August 42 to February 43, uh, things weren't going well in terms of the Marine Corps. And, and what, what was the reason for that? Was it, and, you know, spend some time on that, if you don't mind. So... Uh, Richmond Kelly Turner, uh, I'm sure most listeners are familiar with him, but he uh, is responsible for some of the plans that lead to Guadalcanal. And in some of those discussions, there's an assumption that uh, the United States and its allies are going to be able to move quickly northwestward through the Solomon chain, much like the Japanese did in their early offensives at the start of 1942. Uh, and so he, Turner, goes down to the South Pacific to command the amphibious forces, and very quickly, uh, he and his uh, superior, uh, Vice Admiral Robert Gormley, commanding the South Pacific area, recognized that it, the offensive is not going to flow smoothly. It's not going to be easy. Uh, so they land on August 7th. Uh, the Japanese immediately strike back with uh, land-based uh, planes that can, can come to Guadalcanal and attack the invasion forces. And then they send a surface action group. It's, a, it's an ad hoc formation. Uh, but it's, it's powerful, and they operate cohesively and uh, destroy Turner's screening forces uh, at the Battle of Savo Island. And so the Marines are left on Guadalcanal with, from, from their mind, and I think quite legitimately, not a great deal of support. And they spend most of August and well into September feeling like they have been left alone and isolated. It was sort of known as Operation Str uh, Shoestring because they had so few resources. They had to ferry in fuel in unusual ways. They had to get food, and that was scarce. They had to get in ammunition, more Marines. And Admiral Gormley, who was commander of South Pacific Force, did not even visit Guadalcanal to get a sense of the situation. So he didn't really... I think appreciate how desperate it was for Vandergrift and the Marines. And then there were two carrier battles. Uh, in August was the Battle of the Eastern Solomons. Uh, in October was the Battle of Santa Cruz Islands. And these followed the pattern of Coral Sea and Midway when the opposing carrier forces did not see each other. It was the planes going past each other and doing the damage. Now, how, how did we... How did we grow in capabilities uh, from our experiences beginning in early 42 to that time that we come to the second battle of Guadalcanal in November? Uh, tactics, techniques, procedures, uh, did we have forward fit you know, product improvement on, on fire control radars, radars, et cetera? I know the battleship in your book, you mentioned uh, you know, prodigious uh, upgrades. Uh, was that also true with the cruisers and, and things of that nature? Um, yes, there's a number of, uh, of improvements that are ongoing. You're mentioning specifically sort of material uh, installations, right? Uh, radar is becoming more, more frequent, more commonly installed on, on ships course, that come back from the sailor training as well and experience. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So they're, most of the ships that are, are fighting off Guadalcanal, at least on the U.S. Navy side, have some kind of radar outfit, but it's, it's extremely variable. Uh, the, there are two picket destroyers at Savo Island, for example. Uh, the assumption was that they would be able to detect the oncoming Japanese forces, but they have a, a radar that it, it's dual purpose, surface and air search, and it doesn't detect the Japanese. It's not very effective at that. That's, that's the SC radar. The, the SG radar uh, is much more effective. It's a dedicated surface search set. set. It's, it's more powerful, and it has a planned position indicator display, a PPI, so it gives the operator much better situational awareness. Uh, ships are starting to be equipped with those, but still a large number of them don't have it, uh, and it's difficult for ships uh, to make sense and, and formation commanders to make sense of what's going on. They have uh, information is available from these radar sets, from these early systems, uh, but filtering through that information and using it to act quickly and decisively is, is proving to be extremely, extremely difficult. And, and the Navy is working through that problem through you know, August, September, October, and it begins to develop a, a concept of what the solutions ought to be at about the same time that the November battles are fought. 
Well, even by November, it was still a mixed bag. Uh, a few ships had the SG radar, which he talked about the planned position indicator. And I, I should mention the difference. The A scope was on the earlier ones, and it was essentially a horizontal line, and there would be blips where the ships were, but you couldn't really, you could tell relative size, but not much else. But the PPI scope was like God was looking down on the battle, and you get a circular pattern that shows where each ship is, which is much more helpful. Now, now in, in, the, in those days, uh, the conventional wisdom suggested that uh, the Imperial Japanese Navy was more proficient at fighting at night than we were, so do you agree with that? And then, and, and then really, uh, how, how did they train for that? Because obviously, you know, uh, what, what was the secret to their success in that? <laughs> well, the, I think it's important to, uh, the perspective that you're offering is right. one that has been part of the historiography. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and one of the things that I think is very important to recognize is that both navies, the U.S. Navy, the Imperial Japanese Navy, they train for night combat. Uh, there's an assumption within the U.S. Navy through the interwar period that, well, uh, because of the Naval Arms Limitations Treaties, the, the Imperial Japanese Navy is going to be smaller. So they're going to look for ways to uh, whittle down the size of the U.S. battle fleet as it moves across the Pacific. One of those ways that they're probably going to use is night attacks. Right? Because then you can take advantage of stealth and surprise, uh, and you can use torpedoes. And the Japanese invest in this. Unsurprisingly, the U.S. Navy expects that. Uh, so they develop sophisticated mechanisms for how best to screen the fleet at night, and also how to attack with destroyers. So the U.S. Navy is honing its skills in this area. Uh, the Japanese are, too. One difference uh, that... Uh, the U.S. Navy seems to get anchored on this concept of we'll have to penetrate a screen in order to attack the enemy as the screening concepts get more sophisticated. And so destroyers begin to emphasize using their guns to fight their way through an enemy screen to reach heavy ships at the center of the formation, like a battleship, that they would then fire their torpedoes into. The Japanese perspective is slightly different because as a counterbalance to the smaller size of their fleet, they invest in very powerful, very long-range torpedoes, the Type 93, the long lines. And they're more invested in making stealthy attacks, not using the guns first, instead using torpedoes first, and then retire, reload, come back, strike again. Uh, and they're very good at that uh, throughout this time period, but they're especially good at later in 1943. In a lot of these battles off Guadalcanal, guns play a significant role uh, especially in the ones that we're going to get into. Restric restricted sea uh, area, uh, littoral. Mm -hmm. yeah. And legend or fact has it that the Japanese screened their personnel to get those with the best night vision so they'd be able to observe the enemy ships. And another factor for the night fighting was that the U.S. had air dominance from the planes on Guadalcanal, so... If the Japanese came in the daytime, they could get attacked before they got to the island. So that's why they would come in at night and then flee before the, the next opportunity. An example of that was the Battle of 8-9 August when they sank four Allied cruisers and then went away virtually unscathed. And I think that's an important factor, right? Because, yeah, the Japanese can advance under cover of darkness with high-speed ships. They make a number of runs, right? This is where the name the Tokyo Express comes from. The Japanese destroyers will come to Guadalcanal at high speed. They'll make the run in at night, drop off supplies, personnel, and then flee before they can effectively be attacked by planes from Henderson Field. But that's only a trickle in terms of the amount of troops and supplies it can bring to the island. And the November battle is triggered by an effort where they're trying to bring transports, major numbers of troops to the island. Uh, and so they have to find a way to disable the airfield in order to do that. Now, it, it's my, uh, in my research, uh, 7,000 killed Marines and sailors killed in uh, Guadalcanal, 7,000 wounded or such. Uh, there's a decision to, to replace the, command, the commander, uh, Gormley with Halsey. Uh, can, can you talk about that? And let's start with you, Paul. Well, Gormley allegedly uh, really had a, a defeatist attitude that, that he was kind of hands off. He stayed on his flagship in Noumea. He also had some dental problems. And 
one could suspect that he was depressed by how poorly things were going. And so Admiral Nimitz himself went to Guadalcanal, and then he went to New Caledonia, met with Gormley, and as much as he liked him, he could see that this wasn't working. Admiral Halsey, coincidentally, was being sent out to the South Pacific to take control of the Enterprise Task Force and got a, a message handed to him when he had landed at New Caledonia and opened it up and said, you are to take command of South Pacific Force immediately. And his recorded reaction was, Jesus Christ and General Jackson, this is the hottest potato they've ever handed me. Interesting. And, and so how did that manifest, uh, Trent? Um, so he gets this hot potato, and then what, what does he do? Oh, it, well, in it, the letters that he writes to Nimitz, he says, I, I felt like I had to start throwing punches. That's his quote almost immediately. Uh, you mentioned the Battle of Santa Cruz Islands earlier. That is triggered by Halsey. So he assumes command right before that's happening. One of the triggers for Nimitz to relieve uh, Gormley is the fact that there is an impending Japanese offensive on its way. And Gormley isn't sure how best to, to confront it. He has that defeatist attitude or what could be interpreted as one. Uh, and so Halsey takes over and he tries. You know, Battle of the Santa Cruz Island is an attempt to do something akin to Midway, put the, Jap put the US carriers on the flank of where the Japanese are expected to be and, and then strike them, uh, you know, exercise the element of surprise. It, it doesn't work out as, as Halsey intends, you know, Carrier Hornet is lost, uh, but the Japanese effort to retake Guadalcanal is defeated. And so their uh, a major attempt in October fails. Uh, there's also a great deal of fighting that goes on on the ground. Uh, the Battle of Henderson Field, it's called, where, where Marines and, and, and soldiers fight side by side to push the Japanese back. Uh, so both at sea and on the ground, the, the forces of the United States and its allies are victorious, and now Halsey the next month in November is, is confronted with, uh, with another threat. Um, and, and Nimitz has confidence that he's going he's gonna, to uh, be able to succeed. But, and we should mention that Rear Admiral Norman Scott in October won a night surface action in the Battle of Cape Esperance. Mm -hmm. So that was a reason for some confidence. And unfortunately, he was not the officer at tactical command come November. And it wound up that Admiral Callahan was a few numbers senior to him. And yeah, because they were academy classmates. He yeah. had been Gormley's chief of staff, and Halsey brought in his own, so Gormley was in search of a job, became a task force commander, and Rich Frank wrote a magnificent book on Guadalcanal, and he acidly commented that Callahan went into this battle with absolutely unlittered by combat experience, except for a plane that had hit his flagship earlier in the day. I, I feel like you're a bit unfair to, to Callahan. Um, it, he, is, he is senior to Scott. He does assume responsibility for this mixed task group. Scott does have a victory under his belt, wins the Battle of Cape Esperance. Uh, Scott's tactics are illustrative of something that you said earlier, uh, Paul, the, the fact that they are uh, learning on the fly. Right, because Scott's tactics are very different than pre-war concepts. He forms this very compact, linear formation. Uh, he's concerned about surprise. He's concerned about friendly fire. Uh, he wants to avoid fratricide. It doesn't really work that way. Destroyer Duncan is, is actually hit by both sides in, in uh, that battle. And most people interpret Callahan's formation as being you know, derived from Scott's. It's also linear. But he's got a lot more ships. There's 13 ships in Callahan's line. He's got eight destroyers. He's got five cruisers. Two of the cruisers are very small, Atlanta and Juneau, uh, but the three big cruisers in the center. And I, true, Callahan doesn't have a lot of combat experience, but I think if we look at his actions during the battle, what you see is a fairly uh, cool calculus about he has a concept. He doesn't share it. He can be criticized for that, but he has a concept and he executes it. And if we look at the battle from a strategic perspective, he succeeds because the Japanese are prevented from their goal, which is to bombard Henderson Field and make, uh, disable it so that the, their transports can approach the island. A comment in response? Well, you could argue that, that the, the alignment of ships in Callahan's formation was not ideal. For, they were trying to surprise the enemy. The tail end ship was the... Uh, uh, 
Fletcher, which had the SG radar, the Helena had it, the O'Bannon had it, but those ships were, were back farther and not in best position to give early warning. And so they detected the Japanese coming even from their uh, remote positions. From their positions, but Callahan was not ready to go ahead and say, fire away. They had to wait till he gave that command. Well, before we get into the battle, I'd just like to ask if we could spend a moment on, on night fighting tactics. What, what was doctrinal then that was time honored and, and, uh, and, and important to how we would comport ourselves uh, when we get to that part of the discussion? Well, I can, I can go first. I mean, one of the, the U.S. Navy's principles, I talked about gunfire earlier, mm -hmm. uh, and that's definitely when you come to, to cruisers and larger ships, but also, also destroyers. Uh, gunfire, getting on the target as fast as possible and keeping the guns there, that is one of the, the principles. That's one of the heuristics that I, that I speak about that influence this fighting. And so the uh, night, night battle practice in the U.S. Navy is basically a test of how fast can you identify the target, how fast can you get a fire control solution together, and how fast can you start hitting. And early hits matter a lot in terms of the scoring, in terms of the, the pre-war practice. So ships would often, because you know, visibility at night is relatively limited, they would sometimes open fire just at a very rough solution. Right, to try to secure a hit very quickly and then use the gun as a rangefinder. Yeah, didn't you mention that, in, in, that where they go uh, 500 yards each way until they kind of settle in on? Yeah, so you would, you would try to ladder the target. Oftentimes you'd try to walk up to it. And then uh, the best way in, in the pre-war approaches prior to, prior to radar, it was acknowledged that the best way to get the target once you found the range secure the, the maximum number of hits, but is through a rocking ladder. So fire at the range of the target, fire 300 yards over, fire 300 yards short, fire at the range of the target, and, and walk them back and forth like that, obviously adjusting based on you know, uh, spotting uh, what you could observe from the fall of shell and whether or not you, you appeared to be hitting the target. Uh, and some ships were extremely uh, good at that. And what that also uh, led to an investment in was uh, firing as rapidly as possible. Now, prior to the introduction of radar, usually at night, to, to make it easier to observe the fall shot, that meant firing salvos. Whereas during the day, a lot of ships would fire continuously because you could see much better. But uh, firing salvos made it easier to spot the fall shot at night. An important change happens, and you know, Scott was, uh, triggered this to a certain degree uh, because he emphasizes it in his instructions for Cape Esperance. The ships now have fire control radar that which is uh, an a-scope right it's a, like an oscilloscope uh, and the assumption is now since we always have a, a sense of the range of the target we don't need to spot the way that we used to we can fire continuously it's because scott had his ships fire continuously and a lot of the ships in these battles fire continuously uh, similar tactics with battleships well of course you want to fire as soon as you can get a solution and for those with the great fire control radar, just that gives them a big advantage. And we should also mention that torpedoes were a big factor in the Battle of Friday the 13th. And I have seen the, the track charts, and initially you see the Japanese coming in this neat formation and the Americans coming in a column formation. They got so intermingled and so close to each other. I looked at a track chart during the height of the battle, it looked like a plate of spaghetti, the way they were all intermingled. So close, in fact, that American torpedoes would perhaps hit the ship, but wouldn't explode because they had a safety factor that they had to go so far away mm -hmm. in order to arm themselves, and they were too close. And the other factor is that the U.S. Navy still had terrible torpedoes at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great blemish. On our technical acumen, you know, we can go atomic, but we can't produce a torpedo that was worthy. Worthy. Um, okay, so now we're uh, Halsey's in charge. Uh, there's there's an event where Henderson Field is is compromised. Let's get the battle started. So Callahan's in charge. He's he's on board San Francisco. Uh, Scott is on board Atlanta, and what happens? Uh, on the night, night of the 13th, and then we'll bring you in with uh, Willis Lee and his crew 
uh, right, right on the heels of that. Well, there's some very important context because uh, in October, uh, two, two nights, if I remember right, after the, the victory at Cape Esperance, the, the Japanese had brought two battleships to Guadalcanal. You know, and, the, and the Marines who were there know this as the bombardment. Uh, because it, it destroyed half the planes on Henderson Field, you know, it wrecked buildings that they'd created and you know, forced them all to, to dive into their shell holes. Uh, and it, so that was devastating. And the Japanese are gonna attempt to do it again. They're bringing two battleships, not the same ones, but the same class uh, to the island. And you know, Halsey has a sense of this. Uh, Turner has just dropped off more reinforcements to Guadalcanal. Callahan and Scott are escorting these reinforcement efforts. And you know, so Turner gets word from Halsey, hey, the Japanese are gonna bombard the island, we need to stop them. Uh, and Turner turns to, turns to, you know, metaphorically, Callahan and says, hey, <laughs> stop them. Uh, so the, the 13 ships turn back into, um, you know, head back into Savo Sound, which the, the sailors have started to call Iron Bottom Sound. Now the Japanese are coming um, uh, under uh, Vice Admiral Hiroki Abe, and, but they've got, uh, he's got a screen around his battleships and then he's got sort of a more distant sweeping group. And they're heading south, uh, looking for the turn to head east into uh, Sabo Sound and they miss it because it's a dark night, there's lots of rain squalls. There were supposed to be you know, signals on the, on the shore to help guide their navigation and they don't see them. So they have to turn around and head back and in that, in reversal of course, the formation becomes a little bit disrupted. The uh, sweeping unit that it, he'd expected to have in front of his screen uh, is out of position. Callahan's coming in his line. The SD radar on uh, Helena sights the Japanese, or you know, observes the Japanese, some uh, range of uh, almost 32,000 yards, if I remember right, so very distant. And what I think, this is one of the reasons why I think uh, we, we need to be careful about how we assess Callahan, because his first order is, okay, they're on you know, that bearing, I forget what it is, three, 320 something. Uh, he turns directly at that, that sighting, right? So he's heading right toward the Japanese force. There is some, uh, supposition that maybe he was trying to ca cross their T. I don't think he's trying to cross their T. He's trying to get at the Japanese formation. I think this is influenced to some degree by pre-war concepts. You know, the, the US Navy had developed two formations for how best to penetrate an enemy screen with a mixed force of cruisers and destroyers. Callahan isn't in either of those formations, I think because he thinks a line is gonna be easier to maneuver. But once contact is made, he starts behaving as if he were in one of those formations. And so they get very close together. Callahan orders his destroyers to pass through the enemy formation and turns to port to open up the broadside arcs of his large cruisers. So he's going to attempt to fight a battle that uh, leverages the gunpower of his, of his cruisers and opportunistically can use the torpedoes of his destroyers. Now I suspect, based on what he knew as a staff officer, because he had been chief of staff to Gormley, commander of the South Pacific area, I suspect that Callahan probably had a sense of some of the problems with torpedoes that the US Navy had experienced with torpedoes. So I think that informs his approach. He can't bank on the destroyer torpedoes. Instead, he's going to use the guns of his cruisers, which aligns to what we know about him as a person. He was the kind of officer who wouldn't ask his sailors to do something that he wasn't willing to do himself. So he's looking for a way to take personal control of his battle and ensure that the bombardment doesn't happen. And I think that the best way that he sees to do that is to try to close with each of the battleships in turn with his three large cruisers, San Francisco, Portland, Helena, engage them at close range and disable them. It, it doesn't work, <laughs> but it's a concept. And uh, Paul, I'll let you uh, inject there and then I can add some more thoughts. Well, we should have also add that uh, Admiral Abe apparently wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer either, as evidenced by the fact that he lost his job very shortly thereafter. And I've, I've read the first person accounts and we're talking about six inch guns, five inch guns, eight inch guns against these two battleships that have 14 inch guns. And the, the terror that that noise made, they said it was like a train freight train moving overhead and still you have to keep your nerve to do your job in the midst of that. 
And then he had, Callahan gave an order that uh, odd ships shoot to starboard, even ships do shoot to port. And in some cases, that messed up the fire control solutions on the ships that got shifted. How, how long in, in the battle did uh, Admiral Callahan live? Long enough to uh, issue some orders that reveal more about his intentions. So, yes, he gives that order, which is unfortunate. Odd, odd ships to starboard, even ships to port, or maybe I have it backwards. But right, it does disrupt fire control solutions that have already been developed. Um, you know, and the battle opens as a surprise. I think to some degree Callahan expected this, but you know, the Japanese searchlights come on. And accounts differ. Did the Japanese start shooting first, or did the U.S. ships start shooting first? It, Searchlights come on and people start shooting. Uh, as I said, Callahan orders his destroyers, but the, the, the van destroyers, the formation is, is confused already by the time the shooting starts, but they're, they're ordered to sail straight through the formation. Most of them have a very close range encounter with the Japanese flagship, PA. Uh, one of them uh, is Laffy, if I remember right, passes within you know, 10 yards of the Japanese battleship. You know, and, and the, the crewmen in Port Laffey are shooting with everything that they have. Uh, That's and a sporty distance. <laughs> it is a very sporty distance. Uh, Callahan notices at, at some point that uh, San Francisco has inadvertently taken Atlanta, Scott's flagship, under fire. Uh, and, and we know this because she so was So this using, is a true blue on blue. True, absolutely. Yeah. And she was using a certain dye color in her shells, and mm -hmm. those, that dye color is on Atlanta's uh, upper works the next day. Now Callahan issues an order, you know, cease fire, cease fire on ships. Uh, there is some, some people have suggested, well, he just meant that to be for San Francisco because San Francisco was shooting at Atlanta. He, he wouldn't have told his ships not to, you know, to stop shooting in the middle of this developing melee. But Portland asks, you know, what's the dope? Do you want us to stop shooting? And Callahan says, yes. Why? And the reason why I think can be revealed if we look back at some of the pre-war exercises that the Navy engaged in, in some of those, uh, in night exercises, there would be a breakthrough of the enemy screen. And then once you break through the enemy screen, if you stopped shooting, you could sort of fade away into the darkness. And I think this is what Callahan's trying to do with his three cruisers. He's created this disruption. He's through the enemy screen. Now he wants to try to close with the, the enemy battleships. Paul, you're absolutely right. These are eight inch guns, six inch guns versus 14 inch. But Callahan's a gunnery expert. He's been a cruiser captain before. He, he was XO of Portland. Uh, he was commanding officer of San Francisco before the war. He knows what these ships can do. And he's probably familiar with the Naval War College analysis, which has said if you get three U.S. cruisers of this type within about 8,000 yards of a Japanese, one of these Japanese battleships, you can probably win. Could you take two in sequence? Much, much more doubtful. But that's his concept. But it, as I said, it doesn't work. So Portland gets hit by a torpedo. Her stern is ruptured, so she starts spinning circles. She fires at the Japanese battleship, but cannot continue to engage. And uh, Helena just shoots at targets of opportunity. The, the gloom, it's a very dark night. Visibility is extremely limited. So Helena loses track of San Francisco. So essentially the climax of the battle comes with the two flagships at extremely close range, uh, so close that San Francisco's guns have to depress to come on target mm -hmm. after they load, because they load at an angle of, I think, nine degrees. And that's how close they are. Um, San Francisco scores enough hits on Hiei to disable parts of her, her rudder and steering system. Um, Callahan and, and uh, others now, Did on she the ultimately of San sink Hiei? I know Hiei w was mm -hmm. lost, but. No, no. San Francisco is not responsible for sinking it. San Francisco is responsible for ensuring that she cannot escape. Mm -hmm. Uh, and during the next day, she is subjected by, to a series of attacks by planes from Henderson Field, which survives, uh, and the Japanese scuttle her. They, 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 they can't recover the battleship. Atlanta took it from both Japanese and American guns, and, and it would point out that even with those smaller guns, they couldn't do damage on the, the hull very much, but they riddled the upper works of the HIA, which really gave her serious problems, and despite the fact that the U.S. lost a number of ships and a lot of men, they prevented the bombardment of Henderson Field, which was the prime objective. And 
how, how did the lack of command and control or how did the lack of leadership, uh, so Cal Daniel Judson Callahan is deceased, Norm Scott is deceased, did somebody step in and take tactical command? Was there some doctrinal guidance that talked about that? It was at every ship for itself. <laughs> what was, uh, you know, I think a, a lot of folks will want to know that. Yeah, it, it's a great question. So essentially, uh, uh, Gilbert Hoover, who's the commanding officer of Helena, uh, the command devolves to him. But during the battle, it is so confused, and ships are, uh, the U.S. ships are essentially on their own. They, uh, there is no cohesion left in, in the formation. Um, so the, the van destroyers uh, become separated. They don't act as a unit. Uh, the whole series of them are either disabled or sunk. O'Bannon survives. Um, the the rear destroyers um, did La Laffy survive too? I don't think so. Yeah. I've got some notes. Yeah, that's, that's all right. <laughs> Laffy's well, the crippled battle, and abandoned. Starrett the, survives. Right. The battle mm -hmm. was very cruel to Hoover. He really had the bubble during this time that was going on. The following day, the Juno was torpedoed and sunk. Just went up in an instant. Mm -hmm number of survivors in the water, he sent a message to a Air Force, Army Air Force plane flying overhead, reported the position and said they need to, to be rescued. But he did not stop because he did not want to endanger his ships in submarine infested waters. The Army plane did not relay the message, didn't want to break radio silence, so a lot more people died who could have been rescued and all five Sullivan brothers on board the Juno were lost. It became the subject of a movie. And, and um, my research showed that there were two other sets of brothers. I think there was a pair of three, I think the Whites, and then there were two, two others and the, the tragic nature of this is horrific. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I did see the movie. <laughs> so tell me about, uh, so what time at night you know, did they first engage? What, what are we talking about? Uh, 1830 or was it 0230? No, it's, it's early morning. It's, it's after midnight. I think it's around 130. Okay, so, then the, so you're talking about a six hour, then sun comes up, and, uh, and then what happens? Do, do they just kind of, everybody just sort of... Oh, there's a series of cripples left in, yeah. in the waters of Iron Bottom Sound. Um, so, uh, like, PA is there. Right, and and uh, she starts shooting at um, one of the uh, one of the U.S. destroyers that's there. I think it's Aaron Ward. You know, Aaron Ward's fuel uh, propulsion system is disabled, um, but the Japanese battleships are shooting at her. So they reroute uh, parts of the engineering equipment uh, and basically run the boilers with seawater to try to get under steam because it's either that or or potentially mm -hmm. get destroyed. Um, Portland is still spinning in circles. Mm -hmm. She sights a Japanese destroyer and sinks it uh, with her gunfire. You know, and she's able to do that while she's doing this. Uh, Atlanta is wallowing. They try to beach the ship close to the shore of, of Guadalcanal, but they're they're unable to, and, and eventually it sinks. And at this moment, San Francisco is sunk. No, San Francisco survives. So San survives. Okay, then Atlanta Atlanta is, is sunk. Atla Atlanta Atlanta ultimately sinks. There's there's yeah. a formation. This is what Hoover takes charge of that that goes back, um, uh, and so it's got it's got Helena in it. It's got Juno in it. It's got San Francisco in it. Um, O'Bannon, if I believe right, is one of the members of the destroyer screen, um, and Juno is torpedoed by a Japanese by a Japanese submarine. The, the torpedo uh, passes under San Francisco, and, and Juno is off to the side. She'd already been hit by a, tor by a torpedo in the night, uh, but is able to make steam. Uh, so it passes under San Francisco, hits Juno, and then that's, it just, the ship explodes. Now, and, uh, go ahead, Paul. Paul and, and Hoover was relieved of command by Halsey for essentially deserting these men in the water, but he did the right thing in protecting what was left. And he expected the message to the army plane to get through, mm -hmm. which it didn't in time. Mm -hmm. So wh where was Halsey now? What, what, what type of information was he receiving in real time, if any? And uh, when did he become apprised of the battle damage assessment? And I think it goes to the next question, which we'll talk about when the battleships arrive. 
a few, you know, later. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a significant battle. It's, um, it, Henderson Field survives, but, you know, the Japanese still have plans and intentions, you know, and, and the next night they bombard Henderson Field with a pair of cruisers. Mm -hmm. So it's not as disruptive as a battleship bombardment would have been, uh, but it, it still inflicts damage. And they're trying to create the ability, again, to bring these, these transports. Halsey has one aircraft carrier left, Enterprise, and he's deliberately keeping her fairly far to the south of the Solomon so that her planes can participate, but she's, she's out of uh, harm's way. And part of the Enterprise Task Force is Lee's group with, with two battleships, uh, Washington and South Dakota. And so this is, this is the next card that Halsey has to play. If the Japanese are going to keep coming, how do I prevent another bombardment? How do I preserve Henderson Field? Well, I'm going to send in Lee and his, and his battleships. But uh, Admiral Kincaid was in, in charge of the, the float group, and he kept Lee's battleships too far to the south, so they could not interpose on that following night. They did not get involved till the night of the 14th and 15th. And it was a desperation measure because the battleships are designed to fight at long range in blue water, open seas, and here they've got this narrow air, iron bottom sound. And for an escort, they got four destroyers, uh, the Benham, Gwynn, Preston, and Walk, not that they were a destroyer division, but they just happened to have the most fuel on board. There was no unit commander for the destroyers. And he set up, a, Lee set up a column formation with the four destroyers ahead, then flagship Washington, then South Dakota. South Dakota, right. What were the differences in the capabilities? Because I know there was a lot of uh, forward fits and back fits and all this. Uh, how were uh, South Dakota and Washington uh, complementary or... Essentially the same. They were the same, okay. There's a crucial difference in their fire control procedures, though. So uh, Lee has Washington operating uh, a, at a very high level of efficiency and also integrating the best of pre-war concepts with the modern technology of radar. So Washington's fire control team is going to use radar ranges and visual bearings in terms of how to shoot. And that's the most accurate way that you could shoot this way in the U.S. Navy in late 1942. Use radar to predict the range. It's very accurate with range, but don't try to rely on radar for bearing because it doesn't have sufficient bearing discrimination to really bring the guns on target. South Dakota's uh, fire control team tries to use radar for both. The, the Lee and the uh, gunnery officer and the fire control officer, Ed Hooper, had that crew really trained to a high edge. And, and to sum it up, the, the four destroyers wound up unintentionally being sacrificed bait because they just got clobbered by the Japanese at the outset of the battle and roared up in flames. And I talked to Ray Hunter, who was the officer of the deck that night, and to avoid the burning ships, he steered the ship to port. and. Then on South Dakota, they lost power for a while, didn't have the picture, steered to starboard, and inadvertently put themselves in a silhouette position for the Japanese gunners between the Japanese and these fires. So she became an easy target and was riddled with her superstructure. Uh, and the range was about 10,000 yards or so? And it got closer. Yeah. And one man the following day saw the cutout in a hatch combing, and there was 14-inch half moons out of it, which means that the guns were firing just horizontal because you raised them to get more range, and they were too close to. Mm -hmm. there were a, the superstructure was riddled in the South Dakota. A lot of uh, casualties, and they sent men up into the superstructure to separate the living and the dead and rescue those they could. They couldn't show a light because that would be a target. And 
I talked to one man who encountered a, a chief petty officer, this is a few years later, and said that uh, the man came to him because they'd been former shipmates and said he would have terrible dreams at night and he'd wake up and he'd be choking his wife and Paul Backus, who'd been in the South Dakota that night, sent him to the Philadelphia Navy Hospital. Put him, they put him under hypnosis and that cured it. That, we call it PTSD and in that case it was successful, but it's an indication of how traumatic the whole thing was. And then they had the burials at sea the Washington was virtually untouched. One projectile went through uh, radar antenna, and that was about it. But the fire control was just spot on. Lee claimed eight hits in his action report on uh, Kirishima. Subsequent forensic investigation indicates that there may have been as many as 20. Mm. Some of the projectiles dived under the surface of the water and in effect became torpedoes letting in water and the Kirishima was done for. She sank about three the next morning. Now, now when Lee was uh, heading in and of course he was making best speed and I guess uh, that class of uh, battleship is about 24 knots? 27. 27. 27 knots. So they were probably full speed, four burning and two turning. Um, when, uh, but how prepared was he to enter uh, Iron Bottom Sound? Did he have any battle damage assessment? Did he have any clue? Was, did he have any situational awareness about what happened uh, to Scott and to Callahan and to the cruisers and that? What, what did he know, uh, if anything, uh, other than get in there and, and, uh, and take care of this business? I, I don't know specifically. I, I can assume... He probably had a fragmentary report, but not details. And uh, by the way, the, I talked to the man who was the captain of the Washington that night, Glenn Davis. He also took credit for turning the ship to port. And it's, as Kennedy said, success has a thousand fathers and <laughs> failure is an orphan. And uh, Captain Gatch of South Dakota had his arm in a sling because uh, he had been injured in the Santa Cruz battle. And there's an a interesting anecdote uh, that uh, in the midst of all this, he lit up a cigarette and the seaman said to him, no, Captain, put it out. That's a, they'll show where we are. And he said, I think they know where we are. <laughs> That's in cigarette. your book. <laughs> you wrote that in your book. Yeah. 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 But, Sonny, your, your, your question is important because I think we've passed over a little bit of context, right? right. So the, the, after the successful bombardment uh, by the two cruisers, uh, the night after Callahan's fight, the, the Japanese send their transports toward Guadalcanal. They've got a, a convoy of 11 of them. And they are sighted and attacked throughout the day. Seven are either disabled or, or sinking by the end of it. So they've got four that are still coming. They're going to initiate an, an emergency bombardment. Hadn't been planned. So they're bringing back one of the battleships, Kirishima, that was uh, part of Callahan's battle. And uh, Karisha Min has uh, two heavy cruisers along, along with her. And then there's a screen, six destroyers, and a light cruiser, and a sweeping unit, three destroyers, and another light cruiser. And so you know, the, there's a significant disparity, at least in terms of number of ships, if not uh, potentially in weight of broadside, uh, between what the Japanese have and, and what, what Lee's got. Uh, it, it, Paul, I questioned the, I think you said inadvertent or use of the destroyers, but I think, you know, Lee is very deliberately putting his destroyers out as a, you know, what we might say sort of callously in modern terms as a speed bump, right? Because he, he knows he needs to, to keep the Japanese at arm's length from his, his heavy ships and the destroyers can help do that. So they, as they're passing uh, west through the narrows between uh, the shore of Guadalcanal and, and Salvo Island, the destroyers are out front, and that's when they run into the Japanese screening unit. Lee has already sort of fought off the sweeping unit, the Japanese sweeping unit, which is coming around the other side of Salvo Island, uh, and they're sighted, uh, and uh, the battleships fire at them from fairly long range. They don't hit anything, um, but they sort of push them to the side. They, they convince the, the Japanese ships that, that it's not going to be worth 
coming all the way around and sort of engaging Lee from the rear. And yeah, a lot of the destroyers are damaged and sunk. Only one of the Lee, four survived. Lee maneuvers, or Washington maneuvers, into the shadows behind the burning destroyers. South Dakota goes the other way. And now something really uh, critical about situational awareness happens. So thinking about radar fits, so Washington has an SG radar set, you know, that's sophisticated with the PPI display, but it's mounted in front of the fire control tower. It's got a blind spot to mm -hmm. the back. The baffles, right. South Dakota was in the blind spot. And so Hooper and the other members of the fire control team, they are tracking a sizable target. And anecdotal evidence, um, you know, so I have this second hand from, from uh, a member of the team. I didn't talk to them myself, but I talked to someone who did. They were convinced that's a Japanese battleship out there. We are tracking it. We have a fire control solution. Admiral, let us open fire. And nearly another Lee, blue Lee's on Lee's like, right. I don't know, <laughs> because we're not sure where South Dakota is. And so the moon has been not providing a great deal of light, but a little bit through the clouds and the haze. And it sets. And the Japanese turn their searchlights on because they're firing at South Dakota. They're riddling its upper works, as Paul was describing. They turn their searchlights on. And so right away, Lee makes sense of the situation. The target we're tracking is over there. The South Dakota is over here. The target we're tracking is not a friendly. Mm -hmm. And he gives the order to open fire, and they do. And yeah, oh, I think it's 96 shells they shoot, oh. and, or, or 97. Uh, no, 75. I have it right there. 75. Now, these are 2,700-pound shells from the 16-inch guns. They weigh as much as a 60s muscle car. So if you ever lusted after, like, a 66 Chevelle, that's what they're flinging at the Japanese. I was an SS-396 man. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, the number of hits is, 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 is disputed. I think, uh, you know, sort of the later analysis probably has a lot going for it. But regardless, uh, Kurishima is... Her, her rudder is disabled. She starts spinning in circles and begins to flood in such a way that it's, uh, her damage control efforts cannot, cannot, um, cannot control it. In his action report, Lee said that, that the radar made the crucial difference in the battle because otherwise they were pretty well matched. But So uh, kind of a cliche, but in the sober light of day, so now the sun comes up after the battleships are there. What then happens? Uh, where, where do the Japanese ships go? Where do, uh, where do we go? You know, go? Uh, what are some rescue efforts that might be engaged in? And then where is Halsey uh, in, in all of this? Well, something that I think really speaks to Lee's awareness is, so he orders South Dakota to retire. You know, she's been uh, essentially rendered combat ineffective. He's already ordered his destroyers to retire. But he takes Washington to the northwest, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, the, and the surviving Japanese formation hustles after him, shooting lots of torpedoes in his wake because he knows that the, the transports are coming. If he can delay their arrival, that might make a difference. Uh, eventually, he turns back around, uh, but he does delay their arrival. But the four, the four transports show up, uh, but they show up very close to, to, to daylight, uh, and the Marines move artillery within range, and they start shelling the ships, the, the ship's beach to, to unload. Planes from Henderson Field attack them, and there's an American destroyer in the sound. It's the only combat ship uh, in the sound that morning, and she starts shelling the, the, the Japanese uh, uh, transports. So although they unload uh, a number of troops, uh, estimated to be at about 2,000, most of the supplies and ammunition they bring are, are destroyed by, by these efforts. Um, so this last, uh, they don't know it's going to be the last at the time, but it ends up being the last major effort that the Japanese uh, undertake to, to try to recapture Guadalcanal is defeated uh, through, through, the, through these means. Um, Halsey has a sense of this, um, and, uh, you know, because a lot of attention has been focused on the convoy, the Japanese convoy, and most of it's been destroyed. The four ships arrive, the four ships are getting, you know, shelled and destroyed, so there's some optimism. It's beginning to emerge at, um, at, at headquarters. Uh, the Washington, South Dakota later rendezvoused at sea, and uh, the OD of, of the 
Washington said we were so relieved to see she was still afloat. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I should add that I, I have talked to Al Church, who was on the bridge with Lee during the battle. And when the f first salvo went out, the shock was such it knocked Lee's glasses to the deck. And he was virtually blind without them. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he so was. here they are groping on the deck <laughs> during the biggest battle. But there was another battle at Noumea. The South Dakota and Washington sailors got into terrible fistfights because the South Dakota believed that the Washington had run away and deserted them mm -hmm. when actually she was diverting attention. But calmer heads prevailed and they made peace thereafter. Yeah, so coming back to Al Church, just to, to set the record on this one, he was Naval Academy class of, I think, 38. His father, 38. Uh, Albert uh, Thomas Church uh, I, was uh, Admiral Nimitz's roommate at the Academy, classmates of 05. And then uh, the grandson, or son now, of Al Church is Tom Church, Vice Admiral, uh, and um, Cl Naval Academy class of 69, so it's just kind of a... Uh, anecdotal thing. The senior church uh, was the head of the Naval Institute during World War II. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, I did not. I did not know that. So, so, um, so the so the this second battle of Guadalcanal, uh, 13, 14, 15, 16 November of 42, but yet uh, the books don't really close on the period of service of the battle itself until February. So what ha what happened beyond that? So what was the behavior? Did was, did, did we change behavior of the of the Japanese fleet in in terms of their supply line? Uh, were there fewer troops, beans, bullets, black oil? Were 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 those upset? And and did that contribute in a meaningful manner to how Marines felt on you know boots on ground at Henderson Field and all over uh, Guadalcanal? What what are your thoughts on on those? Topics. I think Admiral Morrison summed it up well. He said Lee's victory was the fork in the road that led toward the Japanese campaign. There was an anticlimactic battle at Tassifaranga at the end of mm -hmm. November, but that was not decisive. Lee's battle was decisive, and within a few months, the Japanese finally gave up that it was not possible to resupply these troops, so they cut their losses and evacuated. Yeah, Halsey does, uh, gets a lot of uh, credit for the aggressive attitude that he brings to uh, commanding the South Pacific area. I, I don't think he gets enough credit for how he um, emphasized uh, logistics and changed uh, approaches and processes, often through collaboration with the Army, uh, to ensure mm -hmm. that more supplies and material could flow effectively to uh, to Guadalcanal. Uh, there is there's great congestion in the port of Numia uh, in September, for example. And a lot of ships backed up, difficulty unloading, uh, not enough uh, not enough people to just you know physically uh, handle the the supplies and equipment that are coming. And uh, Halsey uh, installs an army officer, it gives him control of the port of Numia. Uh, applies uh, effective logistical concepts uh, to that. And so the, the amount of supplies that are being unloaded at that port changes dramatically from you know, late 1942 to early, early 1943. And the amount of supplies that come into uh, Guadalcanal and, and s soldiers begin to make the, the, the difference. The Japanese are still thinking about retaking the island in December. Uh, there, you know, toward the end of November, early December, they were like, "Okay, you know, we, we've got to figure out how to do this again. One more, one more try, we'll make it." Uh, but by mid-December, they've decided that uh, they're not going to be able to sustain their forces there. They're not going to be able to keep pace with what Halsey's able to do, uh, and so they they agree uh, to to withdraw. Uh, and that's what they do in late January, February. So they they, they wait for uh, you know dark nights with a very limited moon. And there are a number of uh, engagements that are fought, often with uh, torpedo boats, um, between torpedo boats and Japanese destroyers, to try to uh, thwart this, the, the, uh, the Japanese um, effort to withdraw. But Halsey's not convinced, uh, and, and Nimitz also, isn't convinced that this actually is a withdrawal. They're worried it may be uh, another effort to, to, reinforce, to reinforce the island. So it's a little bit of a surprise uh, when um, General Patch, who assumes command on, on the island, takes over from Vandegrift, actually, mm -hmm. you know, 
his his forces join up uh, on the on the uh, western portion of the island. It's like, well, okay, uh, we've won. And he transmits a, a fairly famous message that you know this um, what is it? It's like this station or this this stop on the Tosigate Express is closed. Well, Halsley clearly brought a different cast of mind to this and. One tiny example is that he moved the headquarters ashore from the Argonne, where Gormley was living in unhealthy conditions. It was really a stultifying atmosphere. Halsey, being aggressive, said, well, we're going to get a place from the French that's a good <laughs> place to live. And he went to Guadalcanal, and he met with Vandengriff, which Gormley had not done. And he said, what do you need? I will give you everything I can. What an enormous psychological boost. Sure. Yeah. yeah, and that is really important context to the battles we've just talked about, because Halsey does that before these happen, right before these happen. Uh, it's like around the 9th or so of November. And he, when he returns to Mia is when he gets uh, Nimitz's information drawn from the best intelligence that, that this effort that Callahan and Lee fought was coming. You know, so so Halsey's, Halsey's committed himself to Vandegrift and the Marines. He gets back, you know, another enemy push is coming, thwart it. Now, as we, uh, as we kind of close the program, were there any topics that I should have covered that I may have missed that you'd like to, uh, to share with, with the audience? Uh, it's, har it's hard to, you know, organize your thoughts as economically uh, <laughs> as maybe you two are able to, but I, I want to give you the opportunity to kind of have some closing remarks or, or if there's a question that I should have asked and I missed, please let me know. So, Grant? Yeah, the, you, you alluded to it, uh, and I think it's nice to, to close this out. It's about sort of learning in terms of uh, tactics and doctrine, et cetera. I made a remark about how um, it was difficult to process all the information from, from radars. Uh, ships were beginning to recognize this, and, and the Pacific Fleet staff recognizes this as well. So something happens in November at about the same time as these battles. Uh, and it happens on two levels. So uh, Destroyer Fletcher, you mentioned Fletcher, is, is last in line, Callahan's line, on the night of 12, 12, 13 November. And one of the reasons that ship comes through that battle on skate is because uh, her, comma her com commanding officer, uh, Commander William Cole, and um, uh, his executive officer, Joseph Wiley, set up a, a rudimentary combat information center, it's sort of the first one that the Navy has. Wiley stands uh, at, the, at the door of the radar room. He's, he's wired into a variety of different uh, communication circuits, and he looks at one of the SG displays, and he gives Cole a, a sort of assessment of what's going on, what's happening around, around the ship, and he coaches uh, guns and torpedoes onto targets. At the same time, Nimitz and his staff are recognizing that there needs to be something called a combat information center. Uh, and so Nimitz is issuing instructions in mid-November, telling all the ships of the Pacific Fleet to establish a combat information center and providing some basic outcomes that he wants these uh, centers to achieve, this new shipboard organization to achieve. But he doesn't provide a lot of instructions about how to do it. Then Fletcher's action report comes back to the Pacific Fleet headquarters and Wiley is plucked. <laughs> oh, you know something about how to do this well. Come back and you know, help us set up a school to educate XOs and other officers about how, how to effectively manage all this new influx of shipboard information that is made possible by radar. Thus, we're systems. sharing best practices. We're sharing doctrine. We're sharing uh, combat experience with one another. Exactly. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, kind of that's the point, is that these battles, not only do they lead to uh, a victory in this campaign, but the lessons from them are quickly identified and begin to be acted upon. You were sent to the uh, destroyer Pacific staff to establish this. You could compare it to the aviators who sent back the combat seasoned flyers to teach the new ones what worked. And I, I interviewed Admiral Wiley, and he, he had a wonderful sense of humor. And at the end, I said, thank you very much for a fine interview. And he said, I bet you say that to all the girls. <laughs> <laughs> and I will add one more personal note. Uh, C.R. Calhoun was in the Starrett that night. You're talking about the genealogy of the church family. Well, he was involved in the genealogy of the Starrett ships. After his ship was decommissioned, it was a 1,500 tonner. There was a guided missile cruiser named Starrett. And then in 
this century, there was a new Arleigh Burke Aegis destroyer named Sterrett commissioned in Baltimore, which is where the original Sterrett had come from back in early times. Uh, Cal Calhoun was 94 years old at that time, and he had a long glass, which is the symbol of authority and so forth for the officer of the deck, and presented it to the first officer of the deck. I, I, I was touched. And as was I when you shared that with me earlier, that, that's a great story. And that lineage, and that's who we are. I mean, the, you know, when you think about this battle, when I think about this battle because of my job at the Naval Historical Foundation, you know, I'm reminded that we may have lost nearly 100 Naval Academy graduates in this battle. And, uh, and I'm reminded that uh, the friendships that are forged at this Naval Academy are profound. And, and Norm Scott and Daniel Judson Callahan, class of 11, great friends at school, knew each other as 17-year-olds, died together. Uh, then you look at Lyman K. Swenson and Casson Young, class of 16, died together. Uh, and just, just these stories, the, the Sullivans on uh, Juno, uh, the, the human elements of this and the fact that we as a Navy, and, and it's one of the things we celebrate in our foundation, uh, we, we pluck these heroes out and we, we allow them to live longer. And today, in certain faiths, it's All Souls Day. Uh, and we remember these souls. And that's what makes our Navy and forges our Navy to be as, as great as it is. And of course, uh, these heroes live in the namesakes of the ships that endure and, and carry on. And, uh, and it's, it's the best part, in my opinion, of what we do because our people matter, our, our traditions matter, and uh, it's thanks to historians such as yourselves that tell these stories and get into the minutia of the details because the truth be known, our audience loves this. Okay? <laughs> they want this, and you provide it to them. And, uh, and we're, I'm very grateful that, that we had you today uh, on our show. Uh, I want to uh, focus on, uh, this This is a Naval History Special Edition Battle of Guadalcanal, and Trent Hone uh, wrote this, and you can go right on the uh, United States Naval Institute website and order this and receive it uh, pretty quickly. And uh, we have uh, his other book, Learning War, and of course, uh, Heuristic Guadalcanal Chapter 5, uh, it's worth the uh, it's worth the read just to do that. And then, of course, uh, we celebrate, and it was one of the best books I read all year. It may have been the best book, uh, Battleship Commander by Paul Stilwell, uh, telling the magnificent story of, of Willis Lee, who was blind as a bat but had eight gold medals in the Olympics shooting a pistol. Not all gold, but there were eight medals. Well, he had eight medals. That's <laughs> yeah. more, more than I have. So... Uh, uh, I want to thank uh, I want to thank the, the Jack Taylor Center, the United States Naval Institute, for their warm hospitality. Uh, Ali Wade, uh, our, one of our production coordinators, has been brilliant for us and very supportive. So I thank Vice Admiral Daly. I thank Ali. Franklin Gunther uh, had a, a role in this as well. This was our third program here, and we love it at the Jack Taylor Center. And so if you're out there looking for a place to uh, meet, greet, uh, have a symposium or anything, uh, there is no better place in the, in the metro area than the Jack Taylor Center. Of course, uh, we thank uh, Andrew Taylor, the son of Jack Taylor, uh, for his uh, sponsorship of our show, as we thank Huntington Ingalls, uh, Vice Admiral Chip Miller. Thank you for uh, your leadership and support here. If you uh, like this content, hit like, subscribe, and uh, ring the bell for future content. I thank... Uh, Colin Masso, the uh, executive producer of the show. And uh, I just uh, am, am um, you know, very impressed with this program. I hope you are. Uh, it was a great one. So good night, God bless, and we'll talk soon. <laughs>